right. How's everybody doing today? That was kind of weak. I said, how's everybody doing today? Good, good. I know I have to be interesting. Yes, because I stand between you and a party and all kind of other stuff. But before we get started, I want to say hi to my daughter who is watching via live stream. She's seven years old and she got her adenoids removed today. So her name is Kennedy and she came through like a champ today. So Kennedy, I love you and I just wanted to say that to you. All right. Sunday, November 13th, 2011 is a day that will forever have changed my life. It is a day when I turn the TV on. And it was the first time that I had ever seen in my lifetime a group of African Americans who weren't athletes, who were not entertainers, and who weren't rappers on primetime TV. And there was something positive that was said. When I turned the TV on, I began to look at this group of individuals. And they were tech startup founders. They were people who were working on really cool ideas in the tech space. And when I looked at these individuals, these individuals were regular people. These individuals, none of them were unicorns. None of them had IPO'd or had any kind of exit. But it was an interesting mix because I saw them in the startup space. And what I saw was individuals who were communicating a story that was being told in barbershops in Detroit. Stories that were being communicated in beauty salons in Oakland, California, and in neighborhoods around the globe. And when I saw Soledad O'Brien reach out to regular, ordinary people, I got excited because I ended up being one of those people. And if you look at this picture very closely, they put the smartest people next to Soledad O'Brien. <laughs> so that's the reason why I'm right next to her, folks. It has nothing to do with the fact that I have on glasses and I was the right height and I'm right next to her, it's all because I'm brilliant. <laughs> but this was one of the greatest experiences of my entire life. And the reason why the experience was different for me because I was a kid that grew up with a speech impediment. I stuttered growing up. I was a real frail kid because my mother experimented and we became vegetarians when I was born, which meant that instead of having hamburgers, we ate nut burgers. Try to explain that to your friends. When we had pizza, I would tell people, hey, we're having pizza with chickpeas and broccoli chunks on it. People thought I was weird growing up. And I came from a single parent home. I didn't meet my father until I was 20 years old. And what it did is that it put a major chip on my shoulder. But that chip was important because it helped me to become the person that I am today. That, ch that chip is what nudges me into the future. That chip is what challenges me to do what I do. That chip is what wakes me up every single day so I can go out and I can kill my prey so I can make things happen. Growing up as an African American, the only images that I saw on TV were of Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, and Isaiah Thomas. So I wanted to be an athlete when I grew up. When I became a part of this, it really opened up my eyes because I began to see how wealth was made in this world and in this society. I had a chance to meet some of the top VCs in the country. I had a chance to befriend a billionaire. And that conversation really helped me to understand how money was made in our society. And what I realized is that it wasn't because people were smarter. We learned about this term called meritocracy. And I was like, mer what? I have a BS in mechanical engineering, I have an MBA, so it's not like I'm not intelligent, but I never heard this word meritocracy before, where it talks about whoever is the smartest or you get opportunity because you're smart. It's not because of anything else. And what I began to realize in this process of being exposed to technology is that I was competing against a community that had a 400-year head start when it comes to wealth, not using that as an excuse. But I used it because it helped me to frame my reference in terms of what it was like to be successful in life. And so it really opened up my mind in terms of how wealth was going to be generated in society. And so how important it was for me to be able to understand te technology. They chose the regular kid. Now everybody can see the guns that I have back when I was in college. Because one day I knew I was going to be able to take my family and my mother, we were going to go to the green room, and one day I was going to make it to the league, folks, the NBA. But there was one thing that stood in the way between me and the NBA, 
and that was talent. <laughs> that was the small thing, the small elephant in the room that stopped me from being able to go to the league. So I knew I was going to have to get a regular job someday so that I could eat and have a family and do things that I really wanted to do. But experiencing what I experienced um, with the CNN piece was paramount for me because I began to understand the importance of technology. And if we we're going to close the wealth gap, technology was going to be important because if not, we we're going to create a permanent underclass. And so as I began to take this experience with me in life, I began to look at what was happening in my own city. So we fast forward to 2015. How many people have ever pitched an idea and people found different ways to not fund the idea that you have? We all have, right? Okay. So the Knight Foundation had just created something called the Knight City Challenge. And so they had $5 million to give to people, grand total, who had ideas to change cities. So people were telling me to apply. I was like, look, I have no interest in applying because I'm probably not going to win. Because I had seen the chases of the world come to Detroit and bring $100 million. And I saw where all the money went. And so for me, I was like, I'm not going to apply. But people kept badgering me to apply, so I applied. So there were 7,000 plus other people who applied for the same thing. And so I applied. In January of that year, I ended up getting a call saying that I had won. And I was like, oh. Okay. <laughs> what I did, I had pitched an idea to the city of Detroit. Because what I had learned from CNN is I learned how money was made. And I realized that wealth creation in many cases was aligned with public policy. Wealth creation was aligned with legislation and setting up the proper financial vehicles and organizations so that there is a place for the money to go. So when I pitched my idea, I began to look at what was happening politically in our city. So in 2015, when we had our new mayor, Mayor Mike Duggan, he began to do more things in neighborhoods. And so I pitched my idea to say, we're going to do work in neighborhoods as well. And so we pitched an idea called Rebrand Detroit. And I said in Midtown and Downtown Detroit, there's density, development, there's growth, there's activity. There's all kind of great things that are happening. But if you go about a mile each way, it just kind of falls off a little bit. And so I said, can I bring some of that into a neighborhood? Can I bring that into a community? Because I felt like we weren't creating a city for all people. And so this is an ad that came out in, I think, about April of 2017. And if you look at it, it says, see Detroit like we do. Now, I'm not badgering the person who actually came out with this ad, but he got a lot of bad press, and the ad came down. Because in the city of Detroit, the city is about 88.2% African American. And so when you look at this picture, I don't quite see anybody in there that looks African American. So I put up a tweet that somebody had posted. Our number is different. It said Detroit is 85% black, the poster is 0% black. Well, there's some black print in the background, so that's probably not totally accurate. So my view of I want to come and I want to do something different in our community. I want to be able to make a difference. And so I'm one of 7,000 people who had applied and one of 32 people who had won. So that means that it was less than 2% of the people who had applied won. I had a better chance of hitting the lottery. And most people who hit the lottery end up broke, right? But I won. And so now I had $163,810 to go into a neighborhood. And I was excited about the work we were doing or going to do in a neighborhood. What I began to realize is that after I got into this community and after I got into the neighborhood for a couple of weeks, I realized I was working on a project that I had a year to solve a problem that couldn't be solved in 365 days. I looked like the people that I was serving, but I would drive out to my house in Birmingham in one of the most affluent communities in, in the country. So I didn't have to deal with the same challenges that the community that I was serving. And what I realized, lots of times in the social impact work that we do, what happens is that we go into communities and we do something and we think that they ought to be happy that we're doing the work that we're doing. And what I realized is that it was a privilege to be able to serve the community that I was serving. And I had to realign my thought process because in many cases we call it underserved communities. The nomenclature that we use communicates the wrong message. And what I began to realize is that I was learning as much from them as they were learning from me. And as we started to do the work and we were bringing great thought leaders in there, I realized that the way we had positioned what we were doing 
wasn't going to work. And anyone in here who is an entrepreneur understands how entrepreneurship works. This is a description of entrepreneurship. It's a nonlinear process. There is no roadmap for it. What you start out doing in the beginning is not what you're going to be doing in the end. And over time, what I began to look at is, how am I going to be able to help this community be able to take what they're doing to the next level? Because we were there to help the businesses be able to market their products better. So now we're working with Bloomberg and Associates. We're working with Dover and Co. We're working with people who do town planning. And so we're doing design charrettes. And so what do we do? Okay, so we start out doing stuff on the street. We have complete street diagrams, right? And we're doing medians. Every neighborhood has to have what? Bike lanes. We got to have bike lanes. Even though we're working with a coffee shop or coffee shops that are making less than $3,500 a month, not in profit, in revenue. So the bike lane probably wasn't the main thing they were thinking about at the coffee shop. We were talking about sidewalk cafes and medians and road diets. I mean, all kinds of terms I had never heard of before. But it was interesting because as I was bringing thought leaders in to talk to the businesses, I realized that they didn't have time to work on any of the stuff that we were doing. I was bringing people like Marcus Collins in, who used to do social media for Beyonce and who worked on State Farm's um, marketing piece with Chris Paul. But the business owners were worried about how do they keep the doors open? So they could care less about all the other stuff that, that we were doing. And so as we went through it, I began to think about how do we make a pivot? And it takes us to one of the greatest thought leaders of our time. <laughs> Iron Mike Tyson is a man of very few words. He made over $400 million in his career. But he captures failure in a way that I've never seen before. And he said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And so what do you do when the project that you got funded for, you know you're not going to be able to solve the problem with that money in the time frame? What happens with the idea that you've been working on and you're trying to figure out, is this idea really going to work? Everybody talks about the plan B that they have until they get punched in the mouth, until a real circumstance hap happens. Working with people, you don't know people until you get in a crisis with somebody. I've worked with people, oh, we're the best of friends. And now money's on the table and things change. So what do you do in that particular moment? And so now we had to figure out how do we pivot because we truly wanted to be able to have an impact in the work that we were doing versus just turning in a report and saying that we did what we started out saying that we were going to do. And so we had to really rethink and really had to recalibrate. And in the work that we were doing, what we, what we actually realized is that we had a digital problem with the entrepreneurs. And it took me back to the CNN piece, and I began to think about how can we solve this problem. We began to look at big data. And what we looked at is that there's 28 million small businesses in the United States. And 12.8 million of those businesses have no website. 55% of those businesses are cash-only businesses. And what do we realize? We realize that if somebody lives in the suburbs, are they really going to drive 20 minutes from their house to a neighborhood in an urban community where they might feel that there's a safety concern if they can't find them on the grid. If they go into Google Maps and they, and they don't come up, right? Because you want to be able to have some kind of, some kind of feel for, okay, um, am I going to be safe? Is it going to be a good experience? What kind of food do they serve? What kind of services do they offer? And so we realized that this was a big problem that we had a chance to be able to actually address. 46% of businesses have no website. And so then we found the why in terms of the work that we were doing. It went back to my time at CNN because we began to really see if we could solve this digital problem, it wasn't a Detroit problem. It wasn't a Cleveland problem. It wasn't a Miami in the Dade County problem. It wasn't an Oakland, California problem. This was a global problem. This was a problem that if we could help address this issue, we could help small businesses in communities around the globe. Now, we all know that having a website in and of itself is not enough, but it's a start. It's a trigger. You have to be visible in the landscape in a new economy. And so we began to go down this path. Well, we also found out some other data is that there are trillions of dollars of lost business. Over 90% of people, before they go make a purchase, they go online. So if you can't see the business, 
then what happens? That means that they're going to miss out on an opportunity. doesn't mean that there's not a good product or a good service. It means that they're invisible in the conversation. And so that began to kind of motivate the work that we were doing. And so along the way, what I realized is that work can't be done in a silo. It can't just be me coming in and trying to get something that I'm one person. But work takes a team. It takes a village to be able to get stuff done. It takes people who have a common shared value and vision to be able to make a difference. And it doesn't matter what color people are. It doesn't matter if it's a woman or a man. We have to have people that feel like they want to make a difference and they can bring something to the table. And so what began to happen is that I began to meet different people. And I want to share this quick video because I had a chance to meet John Mida. And so he is... Now the global head of design for WordPress. So I had brought him into brand camp. I had cold called him and then he decided to come out to brand camp. So I was super excited. Two weeks before the conference starts, he leaves Kleiner Perkins, one of the top VC firms and joins WordPress. Now I'm excited because we're thinking about the internet and we understand that WordPress runs 28% of the internet. And so me and John are having this conversation on the way from the airport and I'm sharing with them the work we're doing in neighborhoods. And I want to show you this video for about 48 seconds that, that kind of captures what me and John talked about. What would it take to get 100 businesses that are off the grid online? And, and how would that move the needle? The reason why cities need to think inclusively, not just because it's the right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do. Creativity correlates to having all kinds of viewpoints. The 100 websites program is something that, as I was driving with Hodge, and he was describing it, I said, Hodge, whoa, 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 that's a big idea. And at that moment, I just wanted to be a part of it. I've been around websites since the 90s when websites were invented. And so I'm really used to it. I'm like, a website, you can just type some things, and it's up. What I've learned from Hodge is how a website becomes your storefront, uh, your digital, face of your building essentially so me and john have a conversation next thing you know john is behind the idea so after that we have brand camp a week after that i get a call from john's secretary this is october the 10th 2016 and so at this moment he was supposed to go to atlanta there was a hurricane or something she was like he can't go to atlanta he has an extra day he would love to fly to detroit and he wants to work with you on getting a single website online John flies in, we spend the day, and we work on the Motor City Java website. Me and John are working, burning the midnight oil. It's about 11 o'clock at night. John is a workaholic. John is working hard. And so we said, we're going to just work on getting the idea out there. When we talk about design thinking and all kind of other things, the biggest things is that you have to get the idea in front of people. You have to try the idea out. And so what happens in many cases is that we're scared to try something. So we get it out there, and we work on this idea together. So what ends up happening is that now we have a single data point where we now have a website that's out there. We went, we did another website. After that, I decided to go spend my money and fly to Philadelphia and go to a WordCamp conference so I can meet the CMO of WordPress. And I pitched this crazy idea. I was like, why don't you take your money and fly developers to Detroit so we can work to get some businesses online? Pitch the idea to them, use my own money, and they love the idea. So the next thing... We know we're in Detroit, and we're, this is Super Bowl weekend of this year, and we're working on this idea to be able to get businesses that were offline online. And it was an amazing thing that began to happen. We began to tell stories about businesses and communities that had never really been covered before. And as we began to go down this path, what ended up happening is that we started a movement. I use this picture because it reminds me of where I came from. While John was here, we had a room full of people People that I had spent money working with and utilized his services. And John asked him a very basic question. He asked him, how many people would like to help Hodge in his vision to get people online? Some of these people I had paid them to do stuff, and nobody leaned in. Now, at that point in time, the chip on my shoulder got real heavy. And I'm going to tell you like this, I was pissed because I had spent money hiring some of these people. He did, there was not a hard ask of, okay, you need to put in 40 hours. How many people want to help? How many people have ever worked on something and, you know, and people that you thought were going to help you didn't help you? Right? We've all been there before. I could hear my great aunt talking when she said, you could hear a rat piss on cotton. <laughs> it was quiet as a church mouse in there. I've never heard a rat piss on cotton, so I'm not quite sure what that sounds like. 
But that's what she told me when I was a kid, and I, and I just went ahead and I believed it, right? But we continue to do the work that we're doing because we didn't want our view of what Detroit to look like to be like this. So when we flew the developers in, this is what it looked like. This is how I see the world. I see the world to be this eclectic collection of people who have tremendous ideas from all over. Because I believe that when you bring together people who have great ideas, who have a different background and a different perspective, you bring something really cool and interesting to the table. So the way I grew up not having a father was important. I wouldn't change the way I grew up for anything. Because what it did is that it made me want to work harder for the things that I have in life. And so this is a snapshot from our hackathon in Detroit. And what ended up happening from there, WordPress was so blown away by the businesses that we were working with that they ended up creating TV commercials from these businesses. And so these businesses end up getting over $100,000 worth of free marketing and TV commercials that were in Miami, Salt Lake City, Austin, Texas, San Antonio, Miami, Detroit. And so it was awesome because we're able to move the needle and to be able to have an impact with them. As we started to do it, it began to form this idea that we had called Rebrand City. So we were transitioning from Rebrand Detroit to Rebrand Cities. Cities are typically defined by population, but we want to change that. We want cities to be defined by people. So when you go to Detroit, we want you to be able to go to Narrowway Cafe on Livernoise in the Livernoise Avenue of Fashion and have an opportunity to be able to meet Jonathan and David Merritt, sons of a pastor who have a coffee shop in a community, and it's all about creating a stress-free environment. So when you go to cities, it's not about exploring to look at landmarks, but to connect with people. When you come to Detroit, there's this new restaurant that's opening up, and it's called Alma's Kitchen. And it's ran by these two individuals who have Asian cuisine. And so when you come to the city, we want that to be what you explore. When you go to Newark, because we did work in Newark, we had a chance to be able to meet Aero Farms, which took a facility on one acre of land, an old manufacturing facility, and they repurposed that manufacturing facility to create the largest vertical farm in the United States. And it's equivalent to 380 acres. And they're making kale and lettuce in Newark. And I tasted it. And it tasted like kale. <laughs> and they were making it in about 16 days with no dirt. I don't know how you grew up. But the way I grew up, when you grew something, you needed dirt to grow it. <laughs> they were growing it on this cheesecloth type of material that in 16 days, all of a sudden you had lettuce. And so it was interesting to see how we're repurposing facilities, repurposing buildings and land and creating industries and employing people inside communities and cities. And so the work we're doing with Rebrand Detroit is all about repurposing stuff and helping to be able to show the stories of interesting things that are going on. This is Nate McIntyre from Philadelphia. He used to play football for Villanova. He has a fitness facility called Body Rock Boot Camp. And so working with Nate to get his business online. So when you go to Philadelphia, you can see a business and you can have a chance to be able to connect with Nate. And so when we think about the work that we're doing in Rebrand Cities, it's all about now working together to be able to elevate stories of entrepreneurs. I want to show one of the commercials from one of the businesses that we worked with. I am Micaiah Westbrooks, and I am the co-owner of Bricks Wine and Charcuterie in Detroit's West Village. When you think about it, small business, we're part of the tapestry that makes this city great. So I wanted to be a part of that. You know, I was that little girl that walked past all these other businesses and said, one day, I'm going to do that. Now, some little girl is walking past Bricks. It's sparking something inside her to say, you know what? I want to do it for myself. We started working with bricks. Now, I had never heard of charcuterie before. <laughs> I had no idea with expensive meat and cheese. If they just said meat and cheese, I'd oh, okay, I, I get it. <laughs> I live in Birmingham now, but I didn't, I didn't know what charcuterie was. So it was an educational process for me. But we had a chance to be able to tell her story. And these videos and YouTube have received millions of views in about three months. And we're helping to elevate and to promote the business. And so it's interesting now doing work with WordPress because we have a chance to work with communities and work with businesses to be able to share stories. So I want to close out 
in a second, but I always have to show this picture no matter where I talk. It doesn't matter whether it's related at all or not. <laughs> I'm determined to figure out how to fit it into the picture. <laughs> but I got it because Dwayne Wade just signed with, or is in the process of signing with, the Cleveland Cavaliers. <laughs> all right, we got a couple of Cleveland fans out there. Okay. I don't know if y'all were fans about a month and a half ago, right, right before Kyrie left. <laughs> So this was an event where, for some reason, they had put me all the way in the back of the room. Not sure why they had did that. They just didn't know who I was. So I was all the way in the back by the, by the blue in the back. Now, I told y'all that, that I almost made it to the league, but I didn't get there because I wasn't good enough. But I still had a quick first step. The guys in the back, you can see that they're clearly upset because they didn't realize how quick I was. <laughs> so I get past the security detail. I see D. Wade, and the thought hits me. On D. Wade's bucket list, he wants to take a picture with Hodge. <laughs> so I said, okay, let me go ahead. Let me, let me go and make his day real quick. You can see the pure joy that's on Dwayne Wade's face. <laughs> He's excited about the opportunity to be able to take a picture with me. <laughs> I bend down. I take time out of my busy schedule because I was en route to go to the bathroom and, and also to go get some water. So I asked my friend, um, to take a picture, we talked to his wife, who was his fiance back then, asked her that she wanted to be in the picture. She said no, so we made sure she was clearly in the picture. <laughs> and so we took the picture, posted it online, so then I apologized to Dwayne Wade immediately, said, I'm sorry for interrupting your dinner. I posted the picture because it's clearly important that at that point in time that I let everybody know that I had made Dwayne Wade's day. But I said that's not good enough then. So after the event, I said, what can we do to take this to the next level? So I actually wrote an article that got picked up by a major media outlet, six steps on how to interrupt Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union's dinner with style. <laughs> Dwayne Wade sees it, and then he reshares it, retweets it, and calls me a genius. <laughs> now, me and Dwayne Wade are friends. It's just that he has no idea who I am. The only, the only thing, he doesn't know who I am, but we're friends. Because in the world that we live in today, you can be friends with people that you don't even know. And so one day we're going to do business together, which is why he's in Cleveland. He's just trying to get closer to Detroit. He went from Miami to Chicago to Cleveland. We're about two and a half hours apart, so I'm sure at some point we'll do some business together. So I always show this picture because I just like to have fun. But a part of branding is sharing your stories in real time. And I'll end with this. Rebrand City is a global civic design and brand project that I have the honor and the opportunity to be able to work with WordPress. WordPress decided to take a chance on a skinny kid that stuttered, who grew up without a father, who had an idea, to want to change the world to be able to get businesses that were offline, online. And so we're working together to get 10,000 businesses that are invisible online to be able to tell their stories. And so we're going to cities like Philadelphia, Miami, Portland, and there might be a city that you're in. And we're looking for channel partners to be able to connect so that we can elevate stories and be able to give a voice to the voiceless. My name is Hodge Flemings, and I want to thank you.